Uh, just about one year ago, uh, Ambassador Singh was uh, last in uh, Washington, D.C., hosted him here, gave some bold predictions about what a uh, foreign policy and domestic policy under Modi might look like, especially on the foreign policy. I think most of us hadn't been thinking about it in quite that same context, except would he ever talk to the United States after the, uh, the visa withdrawal? So uh, Ambassador Singh has promised to give us an update uh, based on his predictions from last year and uh, taking a look at what's happened so far and what we can expect to take place in the coming year. So, uh, so it should be very, uh, very interesting. Um, on the heels of so many great summits, so many great visits, and many others that are just on the horizon here. Uh, so Ambassador Singh, master's degree from Delhi University and taught at St. Stephen's College uh, before joining the Foreign Service. Uh, served in overseas posts in Portugal, Mozambique, Nepal, the former Yugoslavia, and the strangest of all in Washington, D.C. Um, then uh, inside Ministry of External Affairs, covered the Americas, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Europe. Uh, so definitely given the toughest accounts inside MEA, as well as Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN in Geneva. Uh, later serving as ambassador to Colombia, Indonesia, and his final posting was as ambassador to Japan. Um, and now holds the Chair Professor for Strategic Studies at uh, ICRIR, uh, based in New Delhi. So Ambassador Singh, I welcome you up to the podium, sir. Uh, thanks, Rick. Just bear with me a moment, and we'll get started. OK, uh, if I slip up this afternoon, it'll be thanks to my extended holiday on the West Coast <laughs> and the jet lag. But uh, let me begin by making one or two things clear before I start. Uh, sorry, before I start, uh, Howie and Tezzy, hello. Uh, we go back to 1981, so uh, that's a long, long time. And I see Sukada-san sitting at the back there. Uh, he was, uh, he's been transshipped out of Delhi and located in Washington. So I hope you will keep uh, India in your mind uh, while you serve here. OK, what, uh, what I propose to do is, uh, well, we all know how complex democracy is and democratic decision making is. We don't need reminders we, we are in Washington, DC. Uh, so uh, I just thought I'll flag that to you, that sometimes there are complexities in, in uh, uh, dem democratic political dysfunction, which, uh, which sort of impacts policy making. But it's not uh, something which is true only here or only in Delhi. It happens in all democracies. Uh, second, I'm not going to give you a listing of, uh, of great things done over the past year or, or what has not been done. Uh, that has been written about extensively in the last uh, uh, month or so, month or two. Uh, and I didn't think it would be useful because, yes, the, uh, the government spokesmen have been here and they've spoken about it. And of course, you know what the <coughs> media and, and the think tanks have been writing about. Uh, what I would like to do is to chart the progress of the domestic and foreign policy agenda uh, against my own benchmarks. And these are benchmarks uh, starting from June last year when I was here and spoke sh shortly after uh, the Modi government had uh, assumed office. Uh, and then again, uh, the assessments and reviews which I made in November, December, and January uh, of uh, 2014 and 15, um, uh, kind of six-month reviews of what's been happening and where we are headed. And once again, trying to see if what originally I anticipated happen, would happen is actually happening. Um, so also, let me clarify that I have no government function. So I'm purely a think tank uh, uh, representative. And in our think tank, like in all think tanks, you speak for yourself. There is no institutional uh, validity, validity to your views. So uh, with that. I will address two, seg uh, two uh, broad uh, elements. First is the domestic transformations in India. And the second is the redefined framework for strategic engagement. And uh, with that, I think, uh, uh, as you probably saw in the flyer and what Rick had asked me to do, just 
point out some of the convergences uh, uh, between the re U.S. rebalance and India's Act East policy, as well as the scenario in South Asia and future prospects. Okay, on democracy one year ago, we had seen that there was a different kind of voter consolidation in India uh, based on a development jobs governance kind of a platform and uh, a uh, demand from the public for uh, what was called attractively the politics of performance over the politics of vote banks and identity. And uh, this was capitalized, this trend in the public was capitalized by uh, Modi's promise of transformative leadership. Uh, and mainly this went through and hit uh, uh, directly into the aspirations of the neo middle class or the neo uh, or politic it also signified the political rise of this new middle class for the first time it was young urban connected and aspirational now all these elements taken together are very much intact even today and i will explain to you uh, how and why and and in and i also tell you a little bit about why things are changing and are going to change a little bit more uh, the Modi wave continued throughout the last year, as you know. So uh, the BJP basically contra controls only eight states, but uh, uh, a third of India's population in those states. Uh, with its allies, it controls about 13 states with about 40% of India's population. So it's becoming a bit of a pole in uh, the national political scene. The Congress, in contrast, at the moment holds nine states. Most of them are small states and 12% of the population of India uh, um, in these states. So even though the BJP had successes, a run of successes over the year, uh, there was a setback in Delhi. And uh, that setback told its own story. And that setback basically meant that political miscalculations and even momentary disconnect with the public opinion can spell a lot of disaster on the political front. Uh, the second story which it told was that uh, India continues to advance towards post-identity-based politics because the BJP kept its vote share, but all other votes went to the populist AAP party. Uh, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't again an identity-based switch. It was just two political parties and what the public wanted to see more of and what they were more impressed by the messaging. Uh, overall, the trend in India continues to be towards post-Congress polity. Uh, the BJP is emerging as one of the poles around which elections are posited. And uh, uh, as you know, the Congress is not really a pole in the populous north, which, uh, which provides for most of the parliamentary seats. Uh, you can expect a further evolution uh, of a national alternative, if you want to call it. Because if, if BJP is going to be a poll, then you, you need a national alternative. It's not clear what it's going to be, because at the moment, there's a little bit of a trend to, uh, to move this towards a revised caste-based Janata platform. Uh, and of course, there's this new remodeled non-identity populist AAP. Uh, so I mean, these are the two prospects which are coming up. And we'll see how the elections which are held this, uh, this year and next year uh, how things play out. So you see a broad trend towards the deepening of democracy, which I had outlined last year, and the growing complexity of political management. Because clearly, the electorate is far more demanding of performance than ever before, demanding of results. There's an urbanizing landscape. There are 400 million people in the cities at the moment. This will become 800 million over the next 35 years or so. So you have a massive push into, into the cities and urbanization. But this segment is not a, it's not a uh, uniform segment. It's, there is a vast spread among this urban uh, segment, some still dependent on handouts, others more aspirational and wanting faster change. And meanwhile, the majority in, in the rural areas uh, will continue to demand urban amenities and a greater share of the progress pie. So the complexity is growing and democracy is deepening. 
competition is deepening. Uh, the BJP does have some memories of 2004, uh, which it do doesn't want to uh, uh, come back and haunt uh, the party's uh, political future, because there was this Shining India campaign in 2004 and went bust. So there is a pressure on the government to pursue reform, to raise growth, but there's also an equal pressure for the delivery of welfare gains. Um, now, you, you've noticed that over the last few months, Prime Minister Modi's outlook is increasingly being molded by this public sentiment. And uh, so he does face these multiple challenges. He's got uh, this aspirational class, which talks about the future and their future. He's got a jobless growth present to deal with. And he's got distress in the rural economy to deal with. So you see this common man discourse coming out more and more in the last uh, few months uh, from Prime Minister and, and the members of the cabinet. And you'll see that uh, this is again a reflection of how deep democracy has become and how governance is going to be directed by, by public opinion. BJP is also struggling a little bit with communication issues. And uh, we, I mean, everybody hopes that uh, uh, fringe elements or a public culture which is different from the mainstream Indian uh, thought processes. These fringe elements don't derail the Prime Minister's main message of development, growth, and progress. Uh, we all hope so. And uh, so I predict that politically, it's going to be a much more difficult road ahead for the BJP uh, in coming months and years, despite the Lok Sabha majority which it enjoys, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's unquestioned dominance over the national political scene. A little bit about national consolidation. That was another issue I spoke about a year ago. First, uh, the prime minister's office is, has, without any doubt, been restored as the hub of decision making. Uh, focus has much, is much sharper on government performance. So we are making progress on that front. I don't. I don't go with the critics who say there's too much of centralization, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this, somebody has to lead the country of this size and take some decisions. Uh, so he, he is the head of the cabinet, and he is the most popular leader in India. So uh, I see no contradictions, really, of over-centralization, et cetera. These things will manage and balance themselves, uh, and they have to, because if the things are going to click and his ideas are going to go down and get implemented, then he'll be working with his broader team. Second thing was about his messaging. And that messaging continued all the way for the first four or five months of his uh, uh, prime ministership. It was the one India, strong India, the team India, with all, development for all, uh, constitution as the only sacred document, uh, building a democratic consensus, instilling national purpose, harnessing so social responsibility, and promoting oneness. So this, these, this was a huge agenda which he uh, outlined. And I would say that uh, it requires continued and frequent reiteration. And I hope that, that that will be more and more forthcoming. Because these are things which are essential for India's uh, national consolidation. Uh, I'm talking about national consolidation as against fragmentation, political fragmentation. Uh, identity politics, etc., which, which last 30, 40 years had, uh, had been quite rampant. Um, then my favorite theme, uh, India as a country which believes in the equality of empowerment and not the partiality of fragmented entitlements. Now, this is a very complicated issue for a traditional society, which is also diverse multi-ethnic, multi-religious, et cetera. But uh, mm, progressing towards an overarching national identity and to a situation where rights are independent of identities uh, and a common civil code, well, this is a real long shot. But I do hope that gradually, slowly, we will, build, we will be able to build progress. And I do think that Prime Minister Modi is well placed to drive further progress. This will depend entirely on three factors. His messaging of inclusiveness and tolerance, the revival of the economy, 
and the delivery on the promise of jobs and greater prosperity. So with, if all these things start taking place, you will see further national consolidation. A little bit uh, on his challenges, you know, high expectations. Well, let me say that the mood of despondency is gone from India, but skepticism is rising. So, so you, you have this, these uh, twin elements which he has to work on. Um, we still await uh, deeper structural reforms in the economy. I'll talk to that in, in a moment. Uh, coalitions of convenience can appear just to thwart the BJP. It's been true in parliament outside. Let's see what happens with these in the elections which are coming. Uh, his biggest challenge, and he outlined this himself in November last year, reorienting the BJP into an inclusive nationalist party representing people from all segments of society. Now, that is his hugest challenge. And that's where, that's where uh, you know, leadership really matters. And uh, it's a question mark, but uh, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, we must remember that in the best case scenario, there will be no majority in the upper house for the BJP till 2017 or 2018 in the best case scenario. So we've got to wait and see for that. But in the meanwhile, I'm almost certain that uh, the BJP will need to seek more partners among regional parties to gain traction in the upper house. Uh, so these are fundamentally his, uh, his challenges in, in the coming months. Okay, a little bit about the political economy. There's much said about what's been done, what reform not been done, etc. I think he's been absolutely spot on with his initial messaging and each stage of that messaging. His priority is nation building, expanding the BJP's political base, and energized governance. And that has always, according to him, taken precedence over major economic overhauls. Uh, he has indicated a preference for incrementalism, no quick fix approach, no reforms by stealth, Everything is, is, is still very much the way he had indicated in the first six months of his, uh, his government. Uh, there's been no rollback of welfareist programs and subsidies. Uh, and that's related to the BJP's widening uh, base across the, across the country. Um, he's, I had described him as market pragmatic rather than market liberal, and that's true. He's, there's some business-friendly accommodation of market forces, but his focus on the rest of society and, and uh, what he calls poverty elimination is very much there. He's done a little bit to dismantle the socialist framework. So we have a Niti Aayog, which has uh, replaced the Planning Commission, but uh, we've yet to see how much teeth the Niti Aayog will have and what kind of a new structure it might have to act as a real think tank for the government and point in strategic directions for the economy uh, for the future. What he has made progress on in dismantling previous centralized structures is cooperative federalism, where as a former chief minister, he has taken, uh, he's understood how important states are and what their role is. So he's, he's uh, moving that on the basis of this cooperative federalism platform. So desired outcomes, according to me, they already clear attracting more foreign direct investment, the Make in India manufacturing push, and building momentum for more difficult reforms, whether it's the GST or labor or land. Uh, these are his desired outcomes, but we haven't got all the instruments in place yet. And uh, we hope that uh, gradually something will happen in that direction as well. Uh, growth is not a switch or a button. So, I mean, I work in an economic think tank. So we are still looking for the cyclical revival of, of growth. Uh, policy measures will take some time. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, of course, uh, mm, there's question. There's a big question among the critics that will incremental improvements actually amount to transformative gains in the economy? And there, I would say that uh, you know that the government is facing tough resistance to reforms, whatever it proposes. Uh, uh, which is reflected in this shift to the common man discourse. Uh, nonetheless, in macro terms, there has been a significant improvement in the economic outlook. What I would hope for the future 
and the immediate future would be that this year, the government needs to project a clearer vision of a reformist orientation. Uh, it has to finish the 1991 agenda uh, where it was left off. It's not good enough to say we did everything which we wanted to do in 1991 and nothing else, need, no other structural change is required. Pricing reforms, sub rationalization of subsidies already started, but has to be speeded up. Uh, privatization um, and something which I believe in, greater trade and investment liberalization. And uh, that has to happen because if India is effectively going to participate in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP uh, initiative, that will really nilly be required as a part of this process. Okay, uh, agriculture. Something which I needed to talk about because I, again, I'm in a uh, economic think tank. This really requires priority attention. Uh, there is absolutely no connect between the agrarian distress at the moment and the land, land, ref, uh, land acquisition bill, as the opposition has pointed out. We have systemic issues of low viability and high volatility in agriculture. You know, everything, 85% one, one hectare holdings, 50% rain dependent, 50% of, of uh, rural households, uh, no, rural households depend for 50% of their subsistence on non-agricultural work. So basically you, you have a situation which, uh, which is crying out for, for change. If you want to move populations into more productive jobs through a pull factor into manufacturing and services and not a push factor of uh, rural distress uh, as you find at the moment, you can't sustain a situation with 7.3% GDP growth and 0.2% agriculture growth. That simply is not going to be viable. Uh, so necessary reforms on agriculture, there's rationalizing subsidies, pricing water, power, urea, fertilizer. Uh, in changing that into, or reorienting that into investments in irrigation and R&D, Crop neutral incentives, because we have some crops which are really mollycoddled, other crops which are very essential for survival, like, seri like uh, pulses, are, we're, we're importing more and more of those. So, uh, and a common all India market for agriculture produce. These are fundamental in the coming months and years uh, to bring about if this agricultural urban transition is going to result, is going to happen in a way of a pull factor rather than a push factor. So with that, I think I'll move on to the strategic foreign policy framework. Um, this broad recognition of uh, Prime Minister Modi's success in the foreign policy domain, and uh, in, in a way, uh, India's back in play. And after a, after a few years of missed opportunities, uh, there is, uh, there's been strangely some criticism of excessive travel on the part of the Prime Minister. So my colleagues and I, we, we did a, a rundown of the 10 top countries and how much their leaders traveled over the last year. And we found that the average travel was 20.4 countries uh, per leader of the, say, G10. And uh, the maximum was... Uh, uh, President Hollande of, of France, 27 countries, followed by Abe of Japan, 26 countries, but several others, more than 20. So our man did 18, and he's been, he's been criticized for that. I think it's just absolutely normal for a rising power aspiring to be a great power one day to energize involvement in global decision making and to assume responsibilities that must come along with that enhanced status. So basically, uh, it's, it's a non-starter. This is really misplaced, this, this sort of thinking. If questions need to be asked of him, they will be asked over the coming year. They have to be related to the operationalization of commitments which he undertakes with foreign powers. So how much are you actually delivering on what you agree with foreign partners? Uh, that should be the question which should be raised, not how many countries you've traveled to. Um, let me stop here a moment and now just in a nutshell
give you the four main factors which are the backdrop or the strategic scenario behind India's shift away from what I call strategic ambiguity of the past. Uh, and these four factors, uh, pretty simple. All of you think tank world, you know them well. The first one is the global power transition to multi multipolarity, the geopolitical realignments, and the fluid power dynamic in Asia. It, without any question, that's, that's the top of the list. The second is a realization about China's rapid rise, its growing assertions in Asia, security challenges in India's periphery, and transgressions along India's boundary as well. And uh, the, the last one is realization that India needs strong and diversified relations with major powers, especially the US, as well as its immediate neighbor, neighbors, to make China more amenable towards India's concerns. So these, these, are, these are the factors which have changed the structure for thinking in terms of engagement at the international level. Uh, the modified framework for strategic engagement. This is coming into place and I've written about, I spoke about the possibilities last year, then I again uh, started to define this towards the end of 2014. Uh, this is first, ambition, credibility, and strategic influence. There's no doubt that uh, this is the direction he would like uh, the country to move. Uh, the second is that we are not non-aligned. We are fully aligned with our own interests. India's economic goals, India's security interests, India's global aspirations, and all the partnerships that enable India's rise. So in a certain sense, one of my colleagues uh, at the think tank uh, describes this as an ultimate India first sort of an alignment. But uh, it was high time that this got enunciated as a national objective. What does this mean? This means that uh, he's pragmatically engaging all major powers. And he's differentiating the partnerships based on the bandwidth of their strategic components. And he's clearly defining expectations from each partner. And he has no ideological constraints <coughs> or any misplaced fear of offending others when he goes into these. Uh, there's no zero sum game. So it's, if India has got to be a pole in the international community, it they cannot work any other way. Um, there's a very robust focus on expanding comprehensive national power, economic, technological, military. Uh, there's a revival of India's historical maritime interests across the Indo-Pacific. You saw how vigorously he's traveled from Fiji to Australia to Mauritius to Seychelles, etc. So uh, that's coming out. This projection of India's soft power, its democratic values, its culture, and utilizing, leveraging the diaspora. So that, that again is a very system, systematic uh, uh, direction of his uh, foreign policy framework. Interjection of India's role and responsibility in shaping a balanced Asian, balanced rule-based Asian security order. That is much stronger now than uh, it was, it actually started around about 2013, this, this effort, but he's brought it into, into being. Uh, he's got three types of uh, engagement priorities. He's flexible on economic engagement. Resolve, he shows resolve on meeting security challenges which India faces. And he shows firmness on India's core sovereign and territorial interests. So there again, it's a, it's, it's a very neat uh, uh, construct. And uh, uh, finally, he's uh, incentivizing foreign, pa foreign partners, better business environment, scope for defense industrial cooperation. So he's got that framework also within the foreign policy dynamic. And more or less, his uh, act east Link West approach is now complete. Uh, his strategy for engaging the Middle East and Africa is still awaited. Africa is going to happen very soon, but uh, there's a summit which is going to take place in, in, in India. Uh, hopefully, the Middle East leg will also come up. Uh, 
he uh, he's very boldly decided he will visit Israel, etc. So let's wait and see what uh, what's, what other places he is going to focus on. Now, moving on to the challenges and convergences of the uh, pivot and the not the, the rebalance and the uh, act east, etc. Let me start with India and China. Now, uh, it's almost impossible to address this in two or three minutes, but I'll try my best. Um, basically, what has happened is that the fault lines have de deepened. They've not gone away, they've just deepened. Uh, we've managed since 1988 our differences. We've kept the borders tranquil, but there is, without any doubt, uneasy peace as China has shifted its position on the boundary after 2005. And so we have a trilogy of issues, the borders, boundary rivers, and trade. All three are conflicted, and uh, they continue to be so. So what did he want to achieve when he visited China a month ago? <clears throat> First, he wanted to achieve strategic communication with the Chinese leadership. And he wants more stable ties. He's made it very clear. He wants an improved ambiance for managing difficult issues. Very good. And he wants mutually beneficial economic ties. So that was the basket with which he had gone the, the, uh, to, to China. Um, this was the first time during a visit to China that an Indian prime minister frankly articulated in public India's concerns. And uh, Frank, frankly and forcefully and clearly without, with, with, you know, he engaged them, his, he, the leadership, but he also conveyed what India expects. The first is the need for, for China to reconsider its approach on the issues which hold back the relationship. Second is his advisory that plans of Ch Chinese plans to reconnect Asia would have to be a joint endeavor with India. And the third is that uh, the recognition that there is the simultaneous reemergence of India and China as major powers in Asia, uh, that has to be there. And in fact, this last one is actually written into the joint communique at the end of uh, the visit. Um, he proposed that for, uh, for, broader, for border tranquility uh, and, re and reducing the threat of confrontations more needs to be done to clarify the line of actual control on the border and to settle the boundary dispute. Now, it's not clear how China is going to respond to that because there's been an initial low-level response saying that, no, no, we don't need to clarify the line of control. We need more CBMs. But we've, we've been having CV, CBMs since the early 90s. So this would be the fifth or sixth uh, edition of, of uh, CBMs. But if you don't know the, if you cannot clarify where the, supposed line of control is, you don't know what CBMs you're going to follow. So let's see what happens. Uh, importantly, the visit saw no endorsement of China's one belt, one road uh, concept. Now, OBOR, as it's called, you know, is basically, as I see it, uh, a question of integrating China's sphere of influence with China's friends benefiting the most. From it. Did I get it right, right mm -hmm. this time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor across Pakistan occupied Kashmir, as we call it, uh, is a direct challenge to India's sovereignty. There's complete double standards in China's treatment of Pakistan occupied Kashmir and the Indian held Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, we know that. We also saw yesterday that they blocked in the Security Council uh, uh, efforts to ask a clarification from Pakistanis why the, uh, the main mastermind for, of the 2008 Mumbai attacks is scot-free. Uh, and the Chinese blocked that progress. So I just saw on the flash that Prime Minister's signaled to China that this is not quite right. Why, why have you done this? So anyway, we'll, we'll get to know a little bit more because I couldn't see more of that uh, flash before we started. Uh, the 
There was no mention of a maritime security dialogue either, because this, this has come up in, in the past. And of course, it's important uh, for the two countries uh, to, to look at the Indo-Pacific and engage in this dialogue. Uh, but perhaps it has, I, I can only speculate, I have no way of knowing why this wasn't there, but uh, probably because uh, there's discomfort in China on, on the fact that India has joined many countries, Japan, Australia, uh, United States, uh, others, in referring to the South China Sea and uh, in, in recent joint statements. So I have no idea what happened, but uh, I, I'll go back to India and try to get a little bit uh, of a clearer idea. Uh, the question to my mind is, will China accept a new type of rising power relations in Asia? Which means accepting India's role in Asia or not. And uh, it's also cl equally clear to me that economic interdependence is no guarantee of respecting each other's core, co core concerns. The Chinese have made it quite clear on many occasions. So, uh, I mean, basically, uh, that's another limitation. Now, what is India's response and what's its likely response uh, as of now? Uh, a pretty carefully modulated but symmetrical response to China's actions affecting India's security. You can expect that. And uh, a more clear-eyed view of what we can expect. So uh, the, what was termed a few years ago as the uh, strategic and comprehensive partnership uh, is correctly resized and re redefined as a development partnership. Uh, and uh, that's where we stand. So now, India-US, just two, or, I'm coming to the, uh, into, uh, to the convergences of the uh, rebalance and activities, but just a couple of points. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, over the course of the last year, uh, the India-US strategic partnership has been placed at the apex of India's foreign policy priorities. Uh, there's, that is, you know, it's, it's not just, it's a democratic values, strategic convergences, and joint actions kind of a framework which is being evolved to back it up. Uh, conceptually, uh, the act East policy and the rebalance are moving closer. We do have some ways to go in fleshing out various things which have been discussed at the summits, the nuclear, civil nuclear deal, the defense trade technology initiative, et cetera, but we're getting there. There are issues related to the economic leg, which is the BIT, the intellectual property rights, totalization, uh, climate change, et cetera. Uh, and to my mind, the BIT is uh, essential for India because we are not a member of the TPP. And uh, to, to avoid investment diversion uh, as, an imp as a negative impact on India of the TPP, we should have a BIT. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a balancer. But we wait and see what is going to happen. And if later, if Rick allows me, I'll talk a little bit about IPRs. That's been the most contentious issue. Um, now, convergences. <coughs> Convergences, well, first, there is one shared strategic objective, a multipolar Asia where everyone rises, quote unquote, and this is from the US Defense Secretary, Ash Carter, speaking at uh, Shangri-La Dialogue a few days ago. Uh, and to back up this uh, convergence, you have this uh, 2015 defense cooperation framework. Now, this is a very, very interesting document. If you look at it, you've got strategic consultations, intensified exchanges, and bolstering defense capabilities. Now, it's also defined in the press releases which accompanied these documents and which were signed that the de defense transactions are a means to strengthen mutual security and to strengthen the strategic partnership. Secondly, that the maritime security cooperation envisaged under the framework is intended to increase each other's capability to secure freedom of navigation. So you've got a intensified cooper cooperative framework with three uh, pillars and then the reasons why you are going into it. Uh, there's 
certainly an element of support for a democratic Asia. Uh, Myanmar is a point in, 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 in this case. Uh, then there is growing strategic relations with common partners across the Indo-Pacific. Japan, Australia uh, come to mind. We have the prospect of upgrading the tri trilateral. Rick will shortly go to the India, Japan, US trilateral. We must think of upgrading it. <coughs> I believe that we are moving in the direction of inviting Japan to the Malabar naval exercises between India and United States. Um, there's a new element which started a week ago, which is a India-Japan-Australia trilateral. And uh, the first meeting was held in New Delhi uh, just last week. And this is at a much higher level than the India-US-Japan existing trilat. So it's already at the undersecretary's level. It's a very good start, and uh, uh, it's the way to go. Um, now, what does this mean? I mean, in economic terms, what it means is that there's consonance on connectivity networks in Asia, whether it's the State Department's Indo-Pacific Economic Corridor or the Japan-led Mekong-India Economic Corridor or India's trilateral highway going all the way uh, across Myanmar to Indonesia, to uh, Thailand and beyond. Uh, the, the question is that will this trilat, which he is going to uh, lead to coordinated actions along India's Near East? Because what we need to do is to have actual concrete programs which counterbalance the OBOR of China with things which India, Japan, and the United States are bringing to the table in terms of regional connectivity and uh, promoting that whether through ADB loans or through, the, uh, through Japan's new $110 billion uh, infrastructure fund for Asian uh, development, I don't know. But I mean, this is the direction to go if they want to validate uh, this uh, uh, trilateral partnership. And uh, we, again, one more co convergence is the shared concerns about freedom of navigation and overflight, uh, peaceful resolution of disputes, under international law. We are also equally supportive of ASEAN-centered, balanced, inclusive regional security order, such as the EAS. My concern is that uh, ASEAN's failure to clearly define a role for the EAS is becoming a matter of concern. It's really becoming something which, because uh, that progress has stalled. And there are divisions, obviously, in ASEAN, and uh, I think the CSIS has an excellent Southeast Asia uh, department. They would know more about these things. But it is becoming a weak link because we can't say that it's ASEAN-centered, but ASEAN doesn't uh, come up to, to meet the challenge of the growing threats to regional order, which, uh, which are obviously there. Uh, the weak points of the Act East and rebalance, I would say, the first one is the economic integration basket. Uh, India is negotiating the RCEP. The US is pushing the TPP. India is not even a member of APEC. Uh, it has the US support and endorsement for it, but it's not a member. It also has diffi some difficulties with some elements of the TPP standards. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the messaging is different because as Prime Minister Modi uh, said in Australia, he doesn't want these uh, regional integration instruments to become the focus of competition and, uh, of, and of rivalry. It's not necessary that these two will, will be contradictory, but uh, of course they have to be then open-ended and uh, 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 open-ended uh, in a way that, uh, the, that the U.S. can, if it wants, participate in RCEP and India, if, it, if and when it wants, can be part of uh, TPP. Um, there are divergences of a similar nature which are uh, evident in bilateral economic relations which flow into this uh, convergence, divergence uh, paradigm. And uh, I think these do require better management and greater understanding uh, between India and the, the US. Uh, Luckily, we've restarted the dialogues, which 
underpin such a pos the possibility and prospect of this understanding. I hope we ha really have to persevere on that line. Uh, there are doubts about the US rebalance all over Asia. That won't go away. It won't go away simply because there was a transition from a G2 to the rebalance, and there are budgetary issues with defense, and there are pre US preoccupations as a major power elsewhere. So they will not entirely go away. So the regional players will be doing a lot of thinking and heavy lifting on their own because uh, these doubts are not, it's not easy to just say, okay, uh, wish them away. They're, they're gonna be lingering. Um, India, on its part, as a, I'm, I'm mentioning this as a uh, weak point, India on its part has much to do to enhance its defense and security partnerships in East Asia expand its naval capabilities, leverage the strategic advantages which India enjoys in the Bay of Bengal, and build maritime cooperation with both SARC neighbors and ASEAN neighbors. And interestingly, India is very well placed to do that. It's, it's got resolved boundaries with all neighbors except China and Pakistan. It's got resolved maritime boundary, uh, boundaries with all neighbors, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, so basically, uh, it's well placed to, to, to drive a maritime security initiative across the Bay of Bengal and that very strategic element of the Indo-Pacific waters. Mm, one more weak point. There's no shared roadmap to address AFPAC security concerns and Taliban efforts to destabilize Afghanistan. Now, quite clearly, I mean, it's okay because the, we are coming, we, we are slowly improving our communication, our strategic communication and all these issues, uh, but we don't have a shared roadmap what to do and how to tackle these, these issues. Deterioration in uh, India's uh, near west are definitely going to constrain India's ability to uh, act as a Indo-Pacific security provider, but uh, I think this progress has to be made by the two, two governments. And let me not say that nothing has been done. Things are be looking better, but let's hope that we can do much more on this. And there's no question about one fact that there's a growing China-Pakistan nexus, and that is going to be a challenge because Pakistan is poised to become an indispensable ally for China's regional and global, global power projection. A uh, little bit of India-Japan, I think we, uh, Sukara san is here, he knows. We're slipping a bit on uh, the civil nuclear deal. We're slipping a bit on defense industrial ties. Hasn't made much progress. And of course, from India's side, we've got to do everything possible to make it, to facilitate the promise of $35 billion worth of public and private financing uh, into the Indian economy over the next five years, which was promised at the last summit. I'll leave it at that. Just a little bit of South Asia. The Bangladesh land border boundary agreement is absolutely path-breaking progress on an issue which has held relations back since Bangladesh was founded. And uh, this has opened the way for land maritime connectivity. Uh, it's uh, allowed the two governments to declare partnership over the blue economy uh, as well as uh, uh, maritime cooperation in the Bay of Bengal. And India's focus now would increasingly be uh, on its critical hinterland, which is Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar, uh, linking all these countries through economic opportunity, uh, in, uh, connectivity infrastructure, and energy corridors. And uh, as far as SARC overall is concerned, SARC will be more or less a SARC minus X approach towards uh, economic integration. Those who are part of it, good. Those who do want to remain out, fine. We'll move on with those who are willing to go forward. Uh, there's been a little bit of a, a buzz about credible deterrence. And this is after the, uh, the operation which uh, the Indian military carried out uh, just across the Myanmar border. Uh, about 10, 15 days ago, and uh, to, to uh, destroy some bases of 
uh, a Northeast India insurgency. Now, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't want, I just want to leave it at the fact that let's wait and see how this, this is not a doctrine. It's not a, we are not sort of, uh, uh, I don't, I would not like at the moment to say that this is some kind of a new development. But uh, yes, the deployment and use of military instruments in support of uh, national objectives. Now, you take the entire case of the Andaman Nicobar Islands, we've, we've got military assets and those assets really need to be used to, to help build a maritime security and HADR uh, uh, cooperation complex with ASEAN neighbors and with the immediate neighbors there. And that would be a, a great addition to, to net security in the region. Final points, future prospects, just a few things. Uh, mm, I do think that uh, there's been very substantial progress over the last year <clears throat> under Prime Minister Modi. Uh, Self-imposed constraints to India's foreign policy have been jettisoned. Uh, I see in the coming months and years a more effective foreign policy and national security framework emerging. And as this strengthens, it will definitely benefit India-US ties. Uh, we have a very solid base for shared objectives in Asia, whether it is the whether it's the creation of a strategic environment which discourages unilateral assertions and or it is the effort to promote balanced open regional security institutions to uphold international norms. I think that again will see further progress. Mm. And then I would conclude by pointing out that uh, I, I said that India is now pursuing differentiated strategic partnerships depending on the bandwidth of the actual strategic element inside the partnership. So if you see it from a overall perspective, uh, the India-US strategic partnership serves the fundamental economic and security interests of both countries and has the capacity to impact positively the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific to mutual advantage. Now, that is the real definition of a strategic partnership. I think we're, we've laid the basis of getting there, but whether this will actually become uh, progress from a natural partnership to a defining partnership, it will really depend on how the two countries, India and the US, follow through on their commitments. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come back there. Yeah. Great. Well, I think you covered pretty much every corner of the earth except Antarctica, so I guess that's the only question that I have uh, left here. Uh, what's the policy on polar bears in Antarctica? Okay. Um, we can take a shot of that. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I, I think you know we all sort of appreciate the fact that India is now playing such an active role in the big game you know, across Asia right now at a time yeah. that you know, we're seeing increased stability. Uh, increased concerns. Um, also, hopefully, as you mentioned, trying to get some some more economic issues, you know, uh, into play here. Get the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, start to more deeply integrate uh, economically. So, uh, so I think we're all you know excited to see what a robust foreign policy. None of us could have predicted, but you did a pretty good job of doing so a year ago. So, uh, good to uh, good to hear the review on that. Um, I'll, I'll start off by asking you know a, a few questions, and then we're gonna we're gonna open it up, but. Um, you, know, you, you talked a bit about uh, about uh, China Pakistan relations. Mm -hmm. uh, what about what about um, what we see here is a bit of an emerging Russia China relationship right now? Um, does that cause some concern? Are you able to differentiate the relations you've got with both, or do you see it as not really something that you expect to really kind of take off? Well, uh, this is something which uh, really bothers uh, uh, the two major democratic partners in Asia. Japan and India. And uh, it bothers us because, uh, because a strategic Russia-China uh, consultation, um, it really means uh, that China has a free hand in, in Asia. And uh, you have the SCO, which is like a security and oil and gas cartel. Uh, you have uh, uh, long-term three, four hundred billion dollar 
worth of commitments uh, on gas uh, and oil between Russia and China, etc. So this is this is a certainly something which uh, does uh, come up as a matter of as a point of concern uh, among policymakers. But that said, I don't think. Uh, I, I would say both. I, neither India nor Japan are going to give up efforts at trying to build uh, Japan in, in terms of trying to build relations with, with Russia and uh, economic partnership with Russia. India continuing what has been a very successful partnership over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, we, uh, we may not agree with the, some of the actions and trends which, uh, which we see. Uh, and I wouldn't like to go into that because these are all, you know, live issues at the moment. We don't know how they will play out. But um, uh, but certainly, as far as India is concerned, we'll try to keep up our focus on maintaining uh, some strength in the India-Russia partnership. It's not much of an economic partnership, basically, at the moment. It's really primarily on uh, defense industrial cooperation. and. Uh, we do have ongoing projects, and we probably have uh, uh, forthcoming projects as well, uh, including the fifth generation fighter project, which, uh, which is ongoing. You know, I, I, getting back to Pakistan for a moment, I, I think some, one transition I've seen already in the Modi government from my engagement with, with Indian government and, and civil society, mm -hmm. the first six months, I felt a lot when I was going to India hosting here that America's continued support and relationship with Pakistan was causing a lot of consternation. I've heard a bit less about that, I think, in the most recent six months. But how, how does that play out? I mean, is that something that gets brought up? You know, still, we, we, we like America, we want to partner with America, but? Uh, or is there an understanding that this is a relationship that we have to continue or we will continue irrespective? How, how does that play in? Is it going to continue to be a wedge or less so? Well, no. I mean, it's, uh whether it's going to be a wedge or no, as I said, is uh, depends on the on the nature of our strategic communication on some of these concerns. Uh, yes, you may be partnering Pakistan, but there's absolutely no doubt about what a headache it is. So uh, similarly, I mean, India has major issues, security issues, and concerns there, and uh, we are open to uh, to a new relationship, but when they want it, yeah. because. Uh, uh, it has to be uh, on the basis of normalcy in our economic uh, uh, interaction. It has to be on the basis of normalcy of regional integration and access uh, to Afghanistan and beyond. And it has to be on the assurance that uh, there is no support for, uh, for uh, extremist uh, elements which uh, can target India and uh, uh, bring back the horrors of the past. Mm. So um, uh, we are quite clear about that. The, um, as far as losing out, well, I mean, South Asian trade is a minuscule element of India's global trade. Our East Asian trade is 33% of our trade. So uh, the, the, the question, the, the imbalance there is quite marked, and uh, which is why I said that we'll move on on a SOC minus X basis. And, uh, uh, the countries which are willing to partner on uh, energy networks, uh, connectivity infrastructure, uh, making use of the advantages of the large Indian economy and opening it up for, for these immediate neighbors, uh, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, I think we should do that. And uh, by extension, uh, need to work together with uh, Japan and the US on India's Near East uh, connectivities with Southeast Asia. I think one of my favorite lines from any uh, event that I've, that I've hosted or chaired, uh, Amitabh Khan from DIPP, somebody had asked him about the lack of integration, economic integration. Why can't India be more like the United States, which has such strong trade relations? And the response was, we would gladly trade you Pakistan for Canada if you wanted that. <laughs> um, one last question on my side before I open it up, which is, um, kind of taking a mirror to those of us in Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, we talked a lot in the past about, you know, we, we, we kind of lost the narrative on the relationship on both the strategic and economic at about the same time, although 
you know, I think the Pentagon did a pretty good job of keeping a pilot light on, even, even during the difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, the strategic relationship is obviously running uh, as fast as it can. And even on the econ front, I, I consistently bring up the numbers look pretty good. FDI is up 45% for numbers that were released yesterday. U.S. India trade is up, institutional investments hitting records. But in Washington, it still feels, you know, based on some things that happened in the last government and such, um, a lot of negativity is out there on the econ relationship. What's the perception in Delhi that Washington is still hard charging and angry or it's toned down a little bit? Uh, can you give us a light on how Washington is seen on the econ front from Delhi? Look, um, you're quite right. I mean, in, uh, in 2013, 2014, um, it was really uh, a unprecedented attack on India on, on issues where which have the least validity. India as a mercantilist power. I mean, right? we, we don't even trade enough to be, uh, to be uh, we don't export, our trade imbalance is $200 billion. It's come down to $136 billion this last year, but uh, uh, you know, we, we, that's the last of the things which India is. So there was a little bit of concern that uh, this kind of targeting of India is unfortunate, unfair, uh, and uh, it was coming at a time when our relationship had come to a standstill, which made it worse. So the impact was pretty deep. Um, I think that we have re-engaged seriously. Uh, we have re-engaged re in the Trade Policy Forum. So that's good. Uh, but it's just been a initial re-engagement. We haven't really progressed the BIT yet. And uh, the review, I guess, is more or less complete in, the, in our finance ministry on uh, our revised uh, BIT model. Uh, I, I said that uh, it has to be uh, in the interest of India to minimize uh, investment diversion uh, threats from TPP by going into a BIT with, uh, with the US. I, I'm not really sure how fast that's gonna happen, but hopefully we'll get there. We still have the issues of immigration and totalization and, and other things to work through. But on, uh, if you allow me a couple of minutes, I would want to say something about uh, the intellectual property rights issue because that's been at the forefront and uh, there's been so much of it all over the place. And uh, I've just finished a, a rather long piece which has not yet been out in the public on uh, IPRs. But uh, fundamentally, let me, let me say that uh, there are two, two things which, which are important there on IPRs. Well, I mean, I fully understand that with 50% of the growth in the US economy coming from innovation over the last 50 years, clearly IPRs are greatly important to America's competitive edge. What's not clear to me is this excessive adversarial tone on Section 3D of our Patents uh, Act and, um, and the norms of patentability which it, it establishes. Because you must understand the historical context of India. It's not the same as advanced post-industrial economy, which the United States is. And we certainly are not going to be able to replicate anything like the American model of $2.7 trillion healthcare economy out of a $16 billion economy or $17 billion economy. But uh, the Indian Patents Act of 1911 gave monopoly rights to British manufacturers over the Indian market. Monopoly rights. So, we inherited the situation. When we became free, we could not even produce penicillin and insulin, which were at that time at the cutting edge of, uh, of life-saving medicines. So it went through a huge process. And in fact, the British makers won case after case in Indian courts and, and continued the monopolies. So by 1970, we had done a new patents act which followed German and other examples uh, on patenting, uh, switching from uh, product patents to process patents. And then once we decided that we we're gonna be a member of the WTO from the inception, we had to go along with the negotiations on, on TRIPS and accept compliance with TRIPS standards, uh, which was done through the 2005 uh, amendment of our Patents Act. Now, in a nutshell, there are two issues. Are the patentable standards new? And are they excessive of, uh, and beyond 
uh, WTO requirement, uh, WTO trips, and is India's approach towards compulsory licensing uh, uh, a, a difficult area? Now, just these two issues. First, um, the Section 3D talks about enhanced thera therapeutic efficacy, and we regard it as a refinement of the inventive step which TRIPS lays down. Now, TRIPS lays down an inventive step, but does not define it. Does not define it in legal terms, does not make an extensive definition of it, because it, it creates a benchmark, and it is up to each government to implement laws which broadly follow this, uh, uh, this parameter. Now, um, in US law, we have non-obviousness as a as a patentable standard. And that non-obviousness in the patent US law sh must show unexpected superior results. Now, how is unexpected superior results different from what India calls enhanced therapeutic efficacy in terms of medicines? And uh, it's not. It's, it's, it's basically a national definition. In US system, the results of whether this is good or no is post-patent. So it's left to the courts to decide whether it was fairly granted or not. In the Indian case, it's pre-grant of patent uh, in, in terms of the law itself. And uh, I think the US uh, standards are pretty, pretty strong uh, to avoid the danger of frivolous innovation and, uh, and evergreening. So there is a law, there is a, there's, there's a similarity, but the way the system works in practice uh, is different in the two, uh, two countries. And as far as the um, balancing trips and public health care, which was the next of our case in Indian compulsory licensing. Uh, now, you, it's fine to say you've got trips, you've got intellectual property, you must protect it, etc. But the dissemination of an intellectual property in society with the twin pillars of affordability and accessibility, it's got to be a national determination. Now, in the case of Nexabar, it was available to 2% of the Indian patient population at rates, of course, which were very high, but even the, even the supply was not insufficient. So there were several attempts to get them to, uh, to give a license, to, uh, to have it produced locally, to rearrange the pricing structures, et cetera. It didn't work. But, well, I think you can be sure that uh, what we are doing at the moment is a public debate going on on, uh, on uh, new intellect, intellectual property uh, regulations in India. Uh, it's out on the net. Over the last three, four months, we've consulted with all foreign partners as well as the domestic industry and international, uh, multinational industry on, on this issue. Uh, we hope to see a very greater, much greater degree of reliability and predictability uh, coming into the intellectual property space. We hope to see greater enforcement coming into, in, into the space. But you can be absolutely certain that public health concerns will go hand in hand with protections for innovation uh, when it comes to, uh, to medicines. Because uh, it is this one area where the rest of the cost borne by society of giving a patent uh, is understandable. But the costs borne by society on, on healthcare directly impact uh, human life. And in the case of life-saving uh, medicines, it can become a deadweight loss in society if you don't do something about it. So basically, uh, that is an element which, uh, which uh, India will always balance. And uh, uh, we, we do believe that our uh, current law is very much TRIPS compliant and will hold up to any uh, legal scrutiny. I'm sure it's going to be a topic for discussion either in Q&A or, uh, or at happy hour afterwards uh, when we <laughs> gather for a, for a drink. Uh, this, this really w was uh, one of the issues that drove a wedge, you know, along with, as you mentioned, uh, some compulsory local manufacturing rules and some cross-border taxation, but, uh, but it feels a little bit lighter now. So let's go ahead and start with Q&A. So let's start up at the front with uh, Ambassador Schaefer. So if, uh, if you could let us know uh, your, your name, affiliation, and, uh, and keep the question fairly, uh, fairly tight, uh, it'd be much appreciated. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Hammond. 
I'm not going to take up Rick's invitation to pursue the IPR discussion. I'm afraid we'd be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to uh, come back to a couple of things that Hamon said in his presentation that look more generally uh, at India's approach to uh, trade and to economic diplomacy. Um, really, uh, one observation on which I'd love to have your comments and one quick question. Uh, the observation is this. You commented that South Asian trade is minuscule, which is true. Uh, but I thought that uh, Mr. Modi's decision to use the Indian economy as a magnet to help leverage greater growth on the part of his uh, smaller neighbors uh, was one of the more far-seeing elements in his new foreign policy. Uh, and I wonder how you, how you interpret that, uh, whether this is just part and parcel of his view that economics is king, or whether there's more to it than that. The question I had was, uh, had to do with your statement that there are doubts about the U.S. rebalance to Asia all over Asia. Uh, what would India, what do you think would the Southeast countries like the United States to be doing? Uh, thank you, Desi, uh, uh, for posing those important and difficult questions. Uh, on, the, on the consolidation of the neighborhood through economic integration, uh, there's no doubt that uh, he is going to pursue it. I already said that it's, it's, it's a integration of the hinterland, and uh, those who are willing to be partners, it's going to be, at the moment, it's Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, 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 what is it, Nepal and Myanmar. But uh, we hope that uh, there'll be more. We hope Pakistan will join too uh, at, at a certain stage uh, when it feels comfortable. Uh, it's, it's this economic, inter I mean, it's interplay of how much economic interdependence they want to, to officially accept with, the, with India. So uh, we're open to that. The, um, he does have a very special focus on, on the neighbors. But uh, this focus is marching along, as I said, on a SARC minus X basis. And uh, it is marching along precisely on the lines which you indicated, which is uh, economic opportunity and uh, the attraction of a large Indian economy and market. Uh, the focus on uh, connectivity, which is not there. I mean, it's, we, are, we are the most, in terms of regional economic integration, we are evidently the the least integrated uh, of all such attempts anywhere in the globe. Uh, that has to continue. And there's a very healthy focus now on uh, uh, energy networks and uh, linking these countries. So these, these, are, these are solid. Uh, we, we need to translate much more of this into actual robust progress. And uh, we need to complete the trilateral highway uh, uh, initiative all the way up to Thailand. And that's promised now in the next couple of years. Uh, we, we need to be able to progress the decisions which were taken at the recent summit with Bangladesh, which is uh, land, rail, and maritime connectivity, and common uh, activities across the blue economy, and, and uh, including maritime uh, issues. So the, these are initiatives which definitely will, uh, will, will carry on. Now, as far as the US uh, uh, and I'm, I'm basically, I'm not saying these are in contradiction to the fact that we have a huge economic opportunity in the East. But you can't forget the fact that uh, if you take the projections of the ADB or the World Bank or any uh, investment bank, the, the bulk of the growth of the global economy over the next 30 years will come from India and these Eastern countries. That's in terms of actual value in dollar terms, et cetera. So uh, the opportunity which we have in the East, the integrations which we, the RCEP and, and other integrations which we uh, are uh, going in for, they are an absolute imperative. And hopefully, since you asked about trade and economic diplomacy, hopefully these give opportunities for India to go in for greater liberalization of trade and investment. Because uh, these are driven by the strategic imperative of being partners in, in, in this uh, regional integration process. But 
they are adding to a domestic discourse saying we've got to be part of that. We have to negotiate these rules uh, to the advantage of India as well as all the partners in the region. But we can't do that without greater liberalization. So uh, I think it's a, a very positive factor as well for uh, Indian decision making uh, to be a member of this, uh, uh, this negotiating process. Now, as far as Asia is concerned, I was not making a point that America has to do more. I'm saying whether you do more or you don't do more, there will be questions. Because the region has benefited for the last 60, 70 years from uh, American power. And uh, the American hub and spoke system is still the backdrop and a kind of a, a safeguard uh, mechanism behind stability in the region. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the question is, the if you, if you take a look at the military part of the rebalance, it doesn't really make a difference. 57 ships going up to 60 ships by 2020. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really, that's not the number which, which really uh, changes to any a great degree. Uh, America will be having uh, distractions and responsibilities elsewhere in the Middle East, in Ukraine, and other parts of the world. There's no doubt about that. So there they will be a, a kind of an uneasy churn, et cetera, which is going on. And uh, this is probably much more true of uh, uh, among the smaller nations uh, than, uh, you know, because then, then, then they realize that, look, things are changing very fast. This strategic flux is sort of uh, happening in such a way. And I'm not saying that uh, anybody in the region is asking America to come in in a way that, uh, uh, you know, is destabilizing or, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's been a reassuring presence. It's been a very positive presence. It's led to greater prosperity across uh, Asia. And we hope that this uh, rebalance is, uh, is, is strong and the commitments to the rebalance uh, remain strong. But questions among uh, partners in Asia will remain. So we will have to pick up uh, wherever, there is a, wherever there is a perceived uh, you know, sense of uh, disquiet. We have to pick up uh, the issues. We've got to do things for ourselves uh, and build those uh, net additions to regional security which, uh, which make the difference. We'll get that question good and answered, too. As you know, we're working on, at CSIS, our agency is working on the uh, external review right now of the uh, rebalance. So we'll, we'll figure that out and make sure that we get it right from here on out. So no, no <laughs> problems. No problems. Let's go up at the front right here. Yeah. Got a microphone coming. Thanks. Again, uh, let us know who you are, who you represent, and, 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 a, and a fairly quick question, if you could. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Dr. Nisar Chaudhary with the Pakistan American League. We contribute in the area of regional security issues and enduring us pakistan relations. Uh, my question is pertaining to, since we have mentioned about domestic policy as well as foreign policy. In USA, when the elections are held, and they hardly question about the foreign policy, when they are in, in national debate going on, there's hardly a one or two questions on foreign policy. In, and mainly their economy, jobs, uh, infrastructure, quality of life, living conditions. And in case of India, how much foreign policy influences the people of India when they have to make a decision who should lead India? And second part is that uh, you mentioned about uh, Common Man Party or Aam Aadmi Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They swept in Delhi. Is it a phenomena or is it just a uh, isolated incident? And the last thing is that uh, India and Pakistan, they are in a race for developing tactical nuclear weapons. Technical? Tactical, tactical nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Both of them are in a race. But my question is, that is there any special recommendation you can make, pragmatic and achievable, that these two countries can restore a degree of trust? Can restore some degree of trust. Mm -hmm. And they not only work together, they also try to put some kind of, manage this kind of race, and at the same time, they can start trade, and as you mentioned, as uh, Tacey mentioned about, and you mentioned about uneasiness of those countries, about American role in that region. Uh, how do you think uh, the neighbors of India would be feeling about the role of India in the region? 
India is also a very big superpower like USA. Thank you. OK. Uh, there are many parts to that question, and I try to remember uh, each of them. The first is that, yes, of course, in, in large populist democracies, I tried to, why did I speak so much about domestic evolving uh, deepening of democracy uh, scene? Because it is all about jobs, growth, governance, and, uh, and uh, politics of performance, which deliver actual welfare gains for the public. Uh, and it's very complex because you have different segments of the public with different requirements and different sectors of the economy which have very different requirements too in terms of policy making. So unquestionably, the, in, in, uh, whether it's in the United States or in India, it's, the, it's really the domestic bread and butter issues which uh, are at the forefront of uh, voters when they, when they think about, uh, 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 about national elections. And incidentally, in India, I mean, it's quite clear that there is a slight difference in state elections and a slight difference in national elections because uh, it continues to be a, a factor of, of somewhat of a divergent voting pattern as far as that goes. Now, um, the foreign policy, I prominently mentioned that because I think the, among the successes of this government over the last one year, uh, the clearest focus which comes out, there is a lot of change in the domestic uh, e economy, in the domestic decision making, etc., uh, which I outlined. But in foreign policy, there's been the, the trend which was creeping in has finally been crystallized into a new uh, approach of engaging the world, which is very, very pragmatic, very clear headed and uh, very practical. Uh, it's uh, how do you secure your best interests? How do you secure uh, your economic interests, your security interests, which are your partners who help you along the way, et cetera. So uh, that's why I had dwelt a little bit on that. But uh, it is not as, uh, it's not a non-factor. It's a factor in the talk shops. It's a factor on the TV programs on a daily basis but it's not essentially a, a factor which influences uh, voting decisions as much as domestic issues do. You're quite right on that. The, the second aspect, uh, I think, what was the second one? Well, there was Pakistan. Pakistan. How, do you, how do you resolve India-Pakistan uh, concerns? Ah, uh, India-Pakistan concerns. <laughs> mm. So we have a conference that's gonna last been, for 16 we've been, hours tomorrow. We've, we've, <laughs> been try, we've, been trying to, we've been trying to address that for, uh, for many years. And uh, oh, the prime minister made the first step as soon as he became elected. So he called all the leaders of the neighborhood, personally called uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Uh, and uh, uh, we were very gratified that he came. And uh, uh, he was present at that, uh, to, in response to that special invitation. Um, the government repeatedly said, including in the recent past, that. We are open to a relationship which has all elements in it, dialogue, economic ties. Uh, there are many things which we've been trying to progress over the last two, three years, which you would be aware of, which is dependent on uh, uh, Pakistan accepting most favored nation status uh, as far as India goes. Um, and that includes energy networks and, and others. There are things which, uh, have been agreed under the SARC ages because there are a basket of four or five things which the whole region needed to do, which were taken up at the last summit. And uh, I think Pakistan, out of those four or five, agreed to do just one. The rest of the region said, OK, we'll go ahead with the, uh, with the other things. So we're doing what is possible. But um, the, I think, uh, basically, it needs two hands, hands to clap and to move forward together. I wouldn't like to go into the national dynamics of Pakistan, because that's not my uh, main area of uh, expertise. But well, we have domestic limitations uh, everywhere. On the nuclear front, I wouldn't like to speculate on that, because you said that both countries are developing tactical nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, l I mean that's, let's leave it to uh, uh, the people who really deal with uh, issues related to nuclear nonproliferation and, and uh, things of that kind, and, and strategic stability. But without any question, 
we would like uh, a greater and greater degree of, uh, of trust, confidence, and strategic stability in the neighborhood. So if you could reach uh, uh, progress and understandings on, on some issues, yes, uh, uh, we, would, we would love to do that. And may I remind you that every year we continue to exchange our lists of uh, nuclear installations, et cetera, with, with each other, which is a very important uh, CBM between uh, India and Pakistan. So uh, uh, we, we really would like to see a more and more stable region emerge. And uh, we wish Pakistan the best. Uh, let's go uh, get some in the, uh, the back. Uh, gentlemen, yeah, uh, third row up. Got time for one or two more, I think. Hi, my name is Rohan Daswani. I'm from the Wilson Center. So, Rohan Daswani. So, given India's strategic position in the Indian Ocean, do you see the formation of a major security pact with Japan countering China's muscle flexing in the South and East China Sea? With Japan? Well, uh, um, The first definitions of the Indo-Pacific came out of summits between India and Japan. And they came out from the present Prime Minister of, of uh, Japan, Mr. Abe, in his first term in office. And uh, uh, even before that, among the leading countries which welcomed India into the East Asia summit. Japan was there. And that was the first time when India really became a part of this uh, regional co construct and possible future <coughs> regional security uh, organization. So uh, the, uh, what we have been progressing with Japan has been a uh, maritime security relationship. Uh, it, uh, it really started in 1999, if you want to go back to it, because there was a major Japanese vessel which was uh, rescued from hijackers and pirates by the Indian Coast Guard. And uh, so the, this, uh, this relationship really goes back now 16 years. And it was building on the Coast Guard front. Now it's also building uh, on the naval, Navy to Navy front. And uh, we have uh, annual exercises planned with, uh, with Japan. Uh, later this year. And uh, I think our overall approach to bring stability to the region by engaging all of Southeast Asia is very similar. Uh, our role in cooperating with each other in the anti-piracy operations off the coast of Somalia and uh, the Gulf of Aden, uh, they're also very much there because right from the beginning, we. Uh, our ships and the Japanese ships have exchanged information and tried to work together with each other. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I think uh, these uh, sea lines of communication uh, in uh, the Indian Ocean are absolutely vital for Japan's economy, as they are for India's economy. So this is an, this is an important leg of our relationship, which will remain. Okay. Well, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up there, but uh, I believe they might be able to stick around for a couple of minutes. We'll have a little reception here with some, uh, some beer and wine. So uh, if you have a burning question, an opportunity there. But please join me in thanking Hamad for giving us his time on this trip. Thank you.